Bueno, pues muchas gracias por acompañarnos en este evento de Future Tense, Convergence Lab y el Tecnológico de Monterrey. La conversación va a ser en inglés, pero si prefieren escucharla en español, hay una opción para interpretación en la parte inferior de sus pantallas. Entonces, nada más hay que dar clic ahí y ya van a empezar a escuchar la traducción. So welcome to Is Your University Designed to Create a Better Future, an event brought to you by Future Tense, Arizona State University's Convergence Lab, y el Tecnológico de Monterrey. My name is Mia Armstrong, and I'm the coordinator of Convergence Lab, which is an ideas journalism and events series uh, brought to you by ASU that connects ASU with partners like the Tec de Monterrey to consider ideas of mutual interest and to work towards a better shared North American future. We work closely with Future Tense, which is a partnership of ASU, New America, and Slate that explores emerging technologies and their impact on society. Today, we're gonna to be discussing how universities can design and redesign to create a better future, not just for their students, but for their entire communities. And I'm selfishly very excited for this conversation because I'm a former student of both ASU and the Tec de Monterrey. I studied abroad for a semester at the Tech Campus Ciudad de Mexico in, in fall of 2017. And I, I had a really life-changing experience there for a number of different reasons. So I like to consider myself part sun devil, part borrego. For those of you who don't know, uh, ASU is a public research university committed to excellence, access, and impact. It was ranked number one in the US and number five in the world for global impact in research, outreach, and stewardship. And as a good Sun Devil, and with my boss listening here, uh, I'm obligated to also say that ASU was named the most innovative university in the US for the sixth consecutive year this year. So forks up to that. Uh, the tech, of course, is a similarly innovative institution, one of the most innovative in, in Latin America and throughout the world. It's an institution dedicated to social entrepreneurship and academic excellence, as demonstrated by its ranking among the top universities in the world for employer and academic reputation. And the fact that I learned this today, just uh, three months after graduation, 21% of graduates either currently own a company or are starting a business, which is uh, quite, quite remarkable. Uh, the tech has more than 30 campuses across Mexico and locations in several uh, international destinations as well. And so as you know, we have with us today uh, President David Garza of the Tech and President Michael Crow of ASU. We could probably spend the next hour going through their lengthy and impressive bios, but that time is certainly um, better spent kind of getting to the substance here. Um, so I just want to highlight that in addition to the shared experience of confronting the challenge of uh, uh, 2020 as a higher education institution, these two presidents and their uh, institutions have an extensive track record of cross-border collaboration, um, including a joint uh, executive MBA through our business schools, high impact research on water and sustainability, uh, the modeling of North American energy futures through our decision theater network, rule of law programs between our law schools and many others, including a collaboration that, that we'll be announcing at the end of this conversation. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, so given all that, I wanna go ahead and, and launch into the substance here. And I'm gonna do so by kind of polling the audience. So I'm gonna launch a poll for all of you all who are joining us on Zoom. You should now be able to see it um, on your screen. The question is, in my mind, the biggest challenge facing higher education institutions is training students to succeed in light of the fourth industrial revolution, adapting to digital and hybrid education models, promoting accessibility and inclusion, or finding alternative revenue streams and business models, it's supposed to say there. This is a, this is a real nail biter, so make sure you uh, you get your votes in. I'm gonna give you all about 20 more seconds here. All right, last call. I'm gonna go ahead and, and close this poll. And I'll share the results with all of you. Um, so you can see it, it was pretty close. The winner here was training students to succeed in light of the fourth industrial revolution, automation, and rapid technological advancement. So uh, I want to dive into that especially more and, and certainly all of these challenges. Um, 
But to do so, I'd like to go ahead and, and start with kind of an umbrella topic that I think hovers above all of these challenges, which is university design and leadership. So President Crow, um, in your recent book, The Fifth Wave, The Evolution of American Higher Education, you kind of trace the development of American higher education uh, institutions across four waves of, his, of historical development, and then you propose a model for a fifth wave institution. So if you can kind of give us the brief uh, spark notes version of evolution across those four waves and what you think institutions should be evolving into in the fifth wave. Well, thanks Mia and thanks everybody for putting this together. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. So the, the 400 years roughly give or take the US has had higher education institutions. The first wave was basically the colonial version of the British College of Oxford or Cambridge in the form of Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, and others that started as small colleges in pre-revolutionary America. There were a handful of these, they got going. They were basically the, uh, the slightly modernized version of what we call Greek academies, teaching the classics, teaching uh, uh, in a very elite model and teaching very small numbers of people. That wave, the first wave, has continued in the U.S., evolving over 400 years. Some of those first wave colleges have gone on to be other things. Others like Bennington College in, in Vermont uh, were formed just uh, less than 100 years ago. Uh, Olin College in Massachusetts uh, less than 25 years ago. And so that model has continued to evolve, and there's, it's populated with a fantastic set of, of, uh, uh, of four-year focused uh, classic-oriented uh, full immersion oriented schools. Uh, you think of a school like Colorado College. Uh, uh, um, you think of a school like uh, Bowdoin College, uh, schools like that that are fully operational. The second wave in the US was really a function of the fact that um, those colleges were all private. They were all started largely by religious organizations initially and then uh, by citizens after that. And so they couldn't get those going in certain parts of the country. So in certain parts of the country, Greek academies got started in the southern states, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia were the first public universities in the public colleges in the United States. And they, they tried to replicate the same thing. So the universities of Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia are the best examples of then the second wave starting and call those the public colleges, the public Greek academies. Later, over the subsequent you know, 250 years or so, the uh, uh, what we saw were teachers colleges were added to this, more state colleges were added to this, community colleges were added to this, and there are now uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, even low thousands of colleges in this second wave, and they're still evolving and moving forward. Now, I will say that that wave uh, also had colleges that then moved up to the other uh, waves later, uh, and is a little bit problematic because there's been a lot of uh, uh, complexity with those colleges performing. The third wave was a truly American manifestation uh, called the land-grant colleges that emerged as a way in which to evolve the United States during the Civil War. Colleges focused on agriculture and engineering, colleges focused on the sons and daughters of working class people, because college up to that point, up to the Civil War in the United States was basically an elitist thing. Elite families, um, uh, very limited enrollments, uh, very limited participation, uh, no practicality, uh, uh, and so the land-grant colleges emerged. There's including the historically black uh, uh, colleges and universities that are land grants. There's less than 100 of these institutions and they have evolved in the last 160 years. Then uh, uh, the, the big breakthrough in American evolution was the fourth wave following the third wave, which was the emergence of the research university, which was a combination of the British college and the German technical institute brought to the United States in three institutions between 1876 and 1890. That was Johns Hopkins University, Stanford University, and the University of Chicago, all of which were formed by philanthropic forces as private institutions that then set the example for the emergence of American research universities. Right after that happened, uh, Columbia, Harvard, Princeton, Berkeley, Michigan, uh, all these other schools decided to become research universities, doing science, doing technology, granting PhDs, and evolving. And these four waves have been fabulous for the United States. I mean, they've been fabulous assets, each of them, each uniquely evolving. And unlike the private sector, where waves of change through evolution always mean the previous form goes away, not true in higher education. All four waves have their own evolutionary patterns. Now they also have their own limits. 
Uh, what has happened in the United States is that wave four then became uh, more and more selective, uh, more and more concentrated on research and then wasn't able to scale with the population. Wave two, the public colleges and universities have had difficulty uh, 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 being successful. They graduate less than half the students that attend. Wave one has become so unbelievably expensive, tuition between 50 and $60,000 a year, unbelievable costs, and then very few seats. And then wave three, the land grants, there's only a handful of those. And so uh, some of us uh, thought it's time for a new wave and driven by the, the previous waves were driven by the forces of the country, the democratization of the country and so forth. So the fifth wave of which ASU is a prototype, we're now no longer the only fifth wave school, are research intensive universities in, 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 in many ways, sort of a, an American version of tech. Uh, uh, and so, in fact, we learned many things in my, in my almost 20 years of visiting tech and engaging with tech, and that was scale, commitment to all of the citizens, commitment to the entire life cycle of education, high school, college, everything. And so, so the fifth wave universities are highly democratized, uh, research intensive, scalable, high speed, technologically driven institutions very much in the spirit of the scale and diversity of the United States. So the fifth wave of which ASU is a prototype, Purdue is another prototype, others are coming along, very similar to tech in a lot of ways. I think we're a little bit more research intensive than tech. Uh, uh, and so, but, but it gives you the sense, but, but, but tech is very scholarly intensive nonetheless. Um, and, so, and so we're very much a university uh, uh, in this fifth wave. So the fifth wave, the way to look at it is universities that are devoted to scale and access and excellence all in the same institution. Yeah, well, thank you so much, President Crow. President Garza, I wanna give you a chance to kind of reflect on that. Certainly there are significant differences between the higher education systems um, in Mexico and the US, but there are also a lot of similarities. I mean, maybe you can also, you know, I know you're the architect of this new model that the tech is implementing, Tech 21. So kind of take us in to, to any reflections that you have um, in terms of this idea of the fifth wave institution, and then maybe uh, the, the sorts of design aspirations that you all have at the tech via this model, uh, Tech 21. Sure, sure. Thank you. And first of all, I mean, it's an honor to be here uh, with you and uh, with all the audience. And uh, of course, uh, sharing uh, this space with, uh, with Michael, I mean, a friend of Tech de Monterrey. Uh, I think that uh, ASU and Michael will be in our history books because uh, the relationship has lasted now for three presidencies. Uh, and uh, it's been an inspiration also for us uh, what ASU is always doing. And I find this concept that Michael presents very, very interesting, very provocative. And, uh, you know, uh, but at the end of the day, I think that what lies behind what Michael is sharing with us, it has to do with impact. And I think that we as universities, we always need to, to reflect and think about the impact that we are having and how can we actually increase that, that impact. It comes to my mind that uh, precisely this week, uh, one of the senior leaders uh, approached me and uh, he mentioned that during the past 30 years that we've been doing distance learning and that we were leading distance learning in Mexico and perhaps in Latin, Latin America, we had reached roughly around uh, 100, uh, 170,000 uh, people in the, in the different degree programs. And now during the past nine months, we have, and, th and this has been uh, perhaps in taking just one course or taking some courses or taking a full degree. Now, during these past uh, nine months, we have over 100,000 students taking a full distance education. So uh, you can see the type of world that we are living in and how we need to reflect about that impact that we need to have. Uh, Mexico, it's a country with great challenges. One of those challenges, it has to do with coverage. Uh, currently, around 24% of young adults uh, uh, attended college. Uh, I'm talking about 25, 34 years old bracket. And uh, this is about uh, close to, to half of what the OECD uh, average is. So to, uh, that's a, a big challenge that we have in our country. Tech de Monterrey, an institution with uh, presence in different cities, together with the sister university, Tech Millennial, together we, we, we account for 150,000 students with presence in about uh, 40, 40 cities or, or so. Um, something that I've been sharing with the community uh, is that uh, I would like our institution to focus in the upcoming five years in the three eyes. 
the eye of innovation, the eye of uh, research, which in Spanish is investigación, and the eye of internationalization. And uh, I think that by doing that, we can increase the positive impact uh, of our university because uh, we, we need to, to also realize that we as a university, uh, we have a different, a different missions. We have the educational mission, but we also need to contribute to the research and to advance and to contribute to the, uh, to the economy. And we also have this uh, outreach, outreach mission. Now, related to, to your comment also about our model, what we have been doing uh, in, the past, uh, in the past seven years now, uh, Tech 21 is an initiative that we started in 2013. At that time, the idea was to, uh, we, we um, ask ourselves, well, uh, can we do better in terms of how we educate our undergraduate students? And part of the reflection was, well, we see that the world is changing very fast. Uh, well, this concept of VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. At that time, uh, we were talking about that. Uh, and uh, we also uh, fell in love with, with this, uh, this phrase that says that when our graduates finish their degrees, perhaps they will work on jobs that do not yet exist. They will use technologies that haven't been invented and they will try to solve problems that are not yet in a radar, those problems. So we started working on how we can transform the current educational model in what we now have in place. It's already implemented all uh, since last year, all of our undergrads are, are going through this model. And this is, uh, what are the key elements of Tech 21? It's essentially centered on challenge-based learning. It's, uh, it's uh, and what we mean by challenge-based learning is that we actively involve the students in tackling relevant problems within a real world context. So the faculty, identify some problem uh, and a problem that is linked with uh, either industry, NGO, the community, and they bring that problem as part of the learning process. Some of these problems are, are uh, social projects. Some of these are business problems. Uh, so we have a great variety of type of, of problems. Do you know there is this Chinese proverb that says, tell me and I forget, show me and uh, I, I might remember, but involve me and I will learn. So now more than 50% of the undergraduate curriculum, instead of being lecture-based courses, are actually challenges that the student has to participate. And many of these are actually within groups. So uh, students are placed in situations where they have to connect, assess, acquire, innovate. Uh, so we, need, we think that with this, they can develop leadership skills uh, that otherwise, perhaps in the context of a traditional lecture-based course, uh, might be more, more difficult. So we have found uh, that it, it's, a, it's a very good model for, for developing not just the disciplinary skills, but also preparing the students with a broader, uh, a broader sense of, uh, uh, and a, a broad, uh, also a broader uh, development of competencies. Many of them, sometimes we call them soft skills that are very hard to develop and that yeah. this model allows you to do that. I think that's, that's really phenomenal and it really gets to this concern that our audience expressed, right, about how to educate for uh, changing circumstances under the fourth industrial revolution. So just um, briefly, President Crow, I want to give you a chance to reflect there. When ASU thinks about um, challenge-based learning, how are you kind of incorporating that within uh, the curriculum at the undergraduate or graduate level? Well, probably the best way for us to think about that is we've tried to, we've tried to create an environment in which the culture of, uh, of uh, our institution can be adaptive and flexible and maximally creative. That is, we, if, if people think that the best way to teach something is the traditional way, then that's okay. But then that traditional way shouldn't limit the creativity of others who believe that there are other ways to teach. Uh, uh, and so, so much so, for instance, that you know, we're, we're, we have a major project underway right now where the student is an avatar uh, inside an alien zoo uh, 12 light years away from Earth in which they're interacting with a species collected by an unknown species in which they're learning evolutionary biology and they're learning ecosystems and they're learning biology in a completely different format. Now that takes immense creativity. We're just down the hall, there might be somebody that says, well, that's all, you know, hocus pocus, uh, who wants to learn that way? So what we've tried to create is a way in which we're, we're uh, more open to uh, finding the pathway that produces the best learning outcomes across the broadest pop population. We're, we're here to serve the entire demographic of our society, not the hand-picked demographic that 
that, that so many schools are focused on. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that if everybody did that, we wouldn't have the means to move forward. So like uh, David and what they're doing at Tech with Tech 21, we're trying to facilitate the birthing of all these different ways of teaching and learning and then uh, allowing maximum creativity and maximum evolution. And that's really what we've really focused on. Uh, yeah. And I think that for the most part, in fact, that more than for the most part, our faculty have embraced that. They're yeah. unbelievably creative and unbelievably excited and interested to be doing things in new ways. Yeah, I think that that flexibility and that creativity is, is crucial. Um, and so I want to uh, go ahead and take a chance to, to switch uh, tones or switch paces a little bit here. Um, as university presidents, you know that we're in the thick of finals or exam season. So we wanted to go ahead and turn the tables on you all and ask some exam style uh, rapid fire question. So uh, the rules here are that you'll get 30 seconds to answer the question um, or less if you can do it in less. When uh, your time is up an alarm will sound and I'm not gonna be lenient about time. So uh, that's that. Uh, but I will however switch off who um, goes first for, for the sake of fairness. Okay. Um, so, so all set, any questions? Nope. All right. Great. Um, so President Garza, let's start with you. Um, what is your message to students or educators who are feeling discouraged after a year of unprecedented challenges? I would say that I am tremendously proud of, uh, of all of them. Uh, and I would, tell, I would tell them, do not focus your energy on what you did not get or did not do this, this year, but rather think of what you've got and ask yourself what you're going to do with that. Especially think about attitudes, I would say, um, values, habits that perhaps you have positively changed during this year. So focus on what you've got. President Crow, what, what would your message be to students and educators? Well, we really don't have time for discouragement. What we have time for is adaptation and moving forward. Discouragement uh, doesn't permit forward movement. You, can, you, you basically have to uh, say to oneself, uh, uh, we've learned a lot, a fantastic opportunity to move forward here, a very, very uh, hard and harsh teaching moment that we're all in, in which we have to realize how we never will allow this to occur again in the way that it's occurred. So it's really a moment to not be discouraged. Yeah. Um, so, uh, President Crow, I'm going to ask you to complete the sentence here for me. A university is? A place in which knowledge is created, synthesized, stored, and transferred to not only students that are on the campus with you in a, in a fully immersive learning environment, but also should be an open beam of the most intense laser light imaginable, empowering learning and creativity throughout the entirety of our society. Very good. And, and President Garza? Um, I would say uh, one of the most transformative, influential, and resilient institutions that humankind has ever created. And uh, I would also say a place to unleash your potential. Great. Um, President Garza, what is one university outside of North America that you admire? Outside of North America, because yeah. in North America, of course, there is ASU. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> sure. uh, outside of North America, I would say, um, I think that uh, perhaps Singapore University of Technology and Design, you know, because of its distinctive approach to things, highly interdisciplinary, experimental, if you would say, I mean, it started from scratch, thinking about how a university, a different university could be. So I think that that's one that I would, I would put. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, President Crow outside of North America, a university you admire? Well, there's several. Uh, university of New South Wales in Australia is highly entrepreneurial, highly energized. Dublin City University in Ireland is uh, unbelievably creative, very much in the tech model. Uh, Ben-Gurion University in Israel. There's also universities that we're working with in uh, uh, Africa that are fantastically desirous of transformation. So there's a lot of fantastic institutions on the planet uh, really moving forward. That's great. I don't know if you get full marks there because I asked for one, but but we'll, uh, we'll maybe you get extra credit. Uh, depends on who the professor is. Um, so I understand that that perhaps um, you two have been well, not perhaps you two have been very busy managing the COVID crisis for your institution. So maybe you've had uh, less time than the rest of us to watch some uh, pandemic TV, pandemic movies, do some pleasure reading. But I do want to ask, um, you know. If you have a, a pandemic TV, pandemic movie recommendation, or if you read for pleasure, what you recommend folks should be reading right now? President Crow. 
So there's a fantastic book called The Ministry of the Future written by Kim Stanley Robinson. If you want to really understand what lies ahead, we're have to, going to have to reconfigure how we make decisions and how we structure ourselves. It's fantastic. And then The Queen's Gambit, which is a multi-part series on uh, 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 Netflix, is really fantastic into the notion of intellect and human development and competition and competitiveness and gender and bias and all kinds of things. It's really a fantastic story. I, I just finished the Queen's Gambit and I, I echo that. And, and we actually just recently had a, a Future Tense event with Kim Stanley Robinson um, talking about ministry for the future. So if you are joining us and you missed that event, you can watch the recording on YouTube. Um, but President Garza, any, any recommendations? Uh, yes, you know, something that I watched uh, during the pandemic, it's uh, this uh, documentary series about our planet by David Attenberg. Uh, I think that it really gets you in reflecting about where, where we are and what we need to do for our planet. So there is this series about the planet. There are also these documentaries about our universe. I think that is always fantastic to realize about where we are in, the, in this universe and what humankind has been capable of. In terms of uh, books, uh, you know, not, right now I'm reading the biography of Robert Iger the, from Disney, uh, an interesting uh, story. So about the experiences on that, yeah. Yeah, perspective is, is very important. And, and you guys were very good about staying below 30 seconds. So it's a little disappointing for me. I would have liked to, to hear the <laughs> alarm sound. But um, but thank you for humoring us with those. Uh, with those, uh, I see President Crow was cheating a little bit there. Uh, but um, I uh, thank you for humoring us with those rapid fire questions. Um, I want to transition into a segment here talking about research, which I think is an incredibly important pillar of both of your institutions. And to do so, I want to bring the audience in again via a poll. So if you're joining us on Zoom, you should be able to see uh, this poll here. And the question is, do you think enough North American universities are designed to conduct research that will help our communities confront existential challenges like the pandemic or climate change? And of course, the answer is yes, no, some, but not enough. I think this is fairly straightforward, so I'll give you all about 20 more seconds to, to finish up answering. All right, well, we, we have a clear winner, so I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Uh, so you can you can see here the resounding answer was uh, some but not enough. I think uh, certainly that was that was my response and perhaps a little bit of a an obvious answer there. Um, my understanding is that the two of you as educational leaders are kind of committed to, to trying to change the default answer to that question to be yes. And I think a lot of people who are joining us on this um, call today uh, would would also uh, include that as one of their missions. Um, and I think one of the things that's been clear in this crisis uh, is that universities have simultaneous obligations to both their students and their communities, right? Um, and so I'm interested in you taking me into how your institution has responded to the COVID-19 crisis at the community level, uh, either through research or, or other activities. President Garza, you talk about this idea of having a high tech, high touch uh, institution. So tell me um, what that means and, and how you've taken that approach uh, in your response to the pandemic. Yes, um, essentially, before we knew about the pandemic, uh, I was sharing with the community that uh, uh, perhaps uh, we are we are seen as a high tech institution because of our background, because of what we do, because of the innovative use of technology, but that we also have we need to keep in mind that we, we want to be high tech and high touch and high touch meaning that connection with the community that connection with the needs of the community and uh, internal community and external community. Related to COVID, uh, when the, the, the outbreak started and the lockdown, uh, we defined essentially a set of principles to, to tackle the pandemic. And one of those principles was related to how to make available to the community, to the community, the uh, all the capabilities of tech, academic leadership, uh, health capa uh, capabilities. We have uh, implemented over 250 initiatives, initiatives ranging from. Uh, uh, COVID monitoring technology in wastewater, by the way, in collaboration with ASU, building ventilators, uh, assistance robots, and there are nearly 30 treatment protocols. Uh, we have also a health system, Tech Salud. Our health system has had a tremendous leadership role at the national level. 
Uh, they have attended over 2,000 patients, a very, very low mortality rate, and uh, also participate in these protocols. And we have provided also support to different organizations throughout uh, different uh, places in Mexico regarding their, their help in the reopening protocols and in the, during the lockdown session. Yeah, thank you so much, President Garza. That's really phenomenal. And, and President Crow, um, one of the parts of ASU's charter is assuming fundamental responsibility for uh, the social, cultural, economic, and overall health of the communities it serves. So how have you done that in light of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic? So there's sort of uh, setting aside that day-to-day -day operation of the university, there's sort of two parts of that. One part is really important, and that is that we now have a starker understanding of what we didn't do, who we didn't educate, who we have that we have an unprepared population who doesn't understand what a virus is, that we have unprepared schools who, done, who, who have difficulty managing through a, a complex moment requiring, requiring very significant resilience. And so we've initiated a huge uh, internal reassessment of ourselves relative to what we do and how we do it and how we're working. But having said that, what we're doing in the immediate uh, moment, uh, very similar to David and Tech, is everything we can possibly do to lower any barrier between the university and our intellectual assets and our creative assets in the community. So we launched ASU for You, uh, which has uh, teaching assets for families that are at home, training programs for teachers to move in new modalities, uh, ways to provide learning assets to anyone anywhere uh, in any configuration through uh, however their lives happen to be going forward, as well as uh, we've uh, built, designed, and deployed a, a high-speed saliva-based testing system that we then make available to the public, and we've tested hundreds of thousands of people here in Arizona in addition to our own community. We probably have 200 or, or more research groups working on every aspect of COVID and COVID-related things that we possibly can, decision-making, community engagement, epidemiology, testing, uh, uh, and so basically, and I think this has been a, a positive in all of this, the university has found a way to as you suggest from our charter, just become engaged with everything, not just the running of the institution, but the helping of other institutions and the helping of the community. And, and uh, for instance, a group of our students uh, built a 300 node distributed manufacturing network for uh, PPE to be made uh, for communities that had less access and did that with distributed uh, remotely uh, managed uh, 3D printers and just everything that you can imagine. You take the students, the faculty, the staff, everyone, you bring them all together and you say that there is no barrier between the university and the community whatsoever. And that was very natural for us. That, that's been just, a, just a, a, a way in which we've really felt comfortable in terms of working. So, so uh, but at the same time, we also see our response to the pandemic has been you know, somewhere between a D minus and an F uh, uh, at the social level and the community level and the political level and the decision level. Uh, on the scientific level, it's been tremendous, but we also now realize the limits of science. Science is not sufficient uh, to produce the kinds of solutions that one needs in these things. And, and this pandemic then is an example of and a portender of uh, some of the complexities that lie ahead. So our siloed world inside the university clearly has not produced the right kinds of knowledge products and training backgrounds yet that we think is going to be helpful and needed for the future. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that that's, that's crucial, right? And that, um, you know, this, this communication and connection of what's going on inside the university to the outside world, kind of breaking out of these, uh, these silos. Um, and, and I want to talk a little bit, you mentioned uh, this idea of, of kind of the, the work that your students have done, that staff and, and professors have done, and I think certainly in the tech, uh, students and, and staff and professors have been key to, to responding to this crisis on a community level. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about innovation and research management. So um, you both lead enormous universities or university systems, and, and kind of my question here is, how do you do it, right? Um, how do you think about research or innovation management and kind of finding this sweet spot of, of supporting but not controlling? President Garza, do you wanna um, talk about that briefly? Yes, uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, the most uh, impactful innovations come from, from the faculty. And uh, essentially what we as administrators have to do is to set up the environment such that those, innovation can, you know, those innovations can flourish. Uh, so, uh, for example, we, we have this uh, low cost holographic type projection system that can be used for distance learning that we've been using actually during the past years for distance learning. What we set up was a program with seed money for faculty 
to start their innovations. They applied and they started working on this. One thing came to uh, to, uh, took them to another level, and think and that now things are are at the at the point where they are being used. So uh, I would say that the same way with the OTT, the Office of Technology Transfer, uh, and uh, we try to see. Uh, what, how we can connect that environment, not just nationally, but internationally. We set up uh, also an, uh, a branch of the OTT office in, uh, in China. And uh, we also have uh, these events, these yearly events for uh, disciplinary and, and interdisciplinary research uh, on, on one aspect of innovation in, of education. This will happen next uh, this, this month. And then in, in February, we have one related to disciplinary research. But there is that uh, th there is the opportunity to to for uh, researchers to interact and to to some do some pollinization and then work on more more innovations. Of course, there is the funding element. So for the funding that comes from from the university sources, there might be some directional aspects that we want to promote related to some problem orientation that we want to. Uh, to contribute through to, uh, through our research, so that's also another way in which we sort of try to uh, orientate the type of innovation that we, that we try to do. What about you, President Crow? How do you think about innovation and, and research management? Well, I think uh, you know there's three dimensions to it. So the first and the most important dimension is the support and empowerment of our individual faculty, who we've really given this assignment to be great teachers and masters of their subjects. And I don't mean just uh, science and technology faculty, but English faculty, history faculty, music faculty, opera faculty, uh, uh, whoever they happen to be, business faculty. Uh, and that means finding a way to facilitate each of our faculty members to be able to be at the edge of what we know in their subject, contributing to it, understanding it, uh, taking in insights and perspectives from other people. So the first and most important thing is the support of our faculty in every possible way. The second thing for us at ASU is to weaken the barriers that have existed, uh, the social and cultural barriers among and between people in different fields, uh, allowing us to have low levels of, uh, of, uh, of uh, resistance, permeable uh, engagement across all fields. And we worked really hard for that. And then third for us has been to uh, pick a handful of really, really exciting, complicated things that we want big chunks of the university to get behind. So our Global Futures Laboratory, which involves 600 faculty members thinking about where we need to build our planet positive outcome, a sustainable outcome for our relationship with the natural environment. And then a second one that we're initiating, which will sound a little weird, but not to me, it's what we call our interplanetary initiative, which we hope to grow into an interplanetary laboratory. Humans will not be bound to this planet much longer. We will be settling the solar system. We'll be mining the asteroids. We'll be, we'll be moving off the earth. We won't have to deplete the resources from the earth because there may be resources elsewhere, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's a second thing. And then our Watts College for Public Service and Community Solutions is, is another example of an entire college devoted to the notion of uh, preparing and evolving solutions at the community level so that we can have a better social fabric and social systems and social support in our society. So it's all three dimensions, support for the faculty, eliminating barriers, and then driving forward significant uh, initiatives that engage large fractions of our energy. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I We have about 20 minutes left here and I wanna direct um, our, our time to the topic that is most interesting to audience members. So I'm gonna launch a poll here for our audience members on Zoom. Um, and the question is, as an audience member, would you rather talk about access to education, internationalization, or preparing for the next crisis? So it's kind of a, a choose your own adventure here. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about whatever you tell us you're most interested in. Quite close. So if you if you haven't voted yet, I'll give you about ten more seconds to do so. All right. I'm going to go ahead and, and close the poll here. And it was close, but it looks like the winner here is preparing for the next crisis. Um, and I think maybe the best way uh, to to start here is uh, 
to ask you both what crises um, are at the top of your mind. What what keeps you up at my, at night in terms of when you're thinking about what we need to prepare for uh, in the future? Uh, President Crow, do you want to start us off here? What's on your list? Yeah, so, so for me, it's our lack of understanding of complexity and resilience that complexity will require. So so technological changes and technological advances are going to free human beings up from tasks that are repetitive and so forth and so on. We're going to have autonomous systems, autonomous vehicles. We're going to have all these kinds of things, but we haven't prepared an educational enterprise that allows people to now really full, fully move forward towards the potential of their life. We're moving towards unbelievable complexities from the fact that we've gone ahead and warmed up the atmosphere by two degrees Celsius on average and possibly as many as five degrees Celsius. Between two and five degrees Celsius, let me guarantee every listener no aspect of your life will be the same going forward. Uh, and, so, and so we're so underprepared. This pandemic is partly a product of our lack of preparedness, our lack of understanding. And so for me, the big challenge is getting people to understand complexity and resilience and the need to work these things out. Uh, and we're not there yet, as we can see in the middle of what we're in right now. I, uh, President Garza, what, what are some other crises that maybe keep you up at night? Well, uh, you know, of course, come to my mind, uh, climate change, um, as, as Michael mentioned, uh, massive migration. I think also uh, comes to my mind, uh, uh, sustainable development goals, the agenda 2030. I, I guess that this is a good framework of, of some of the potential crises there. You, you'll find climate change. We'll have uh, clean water challenges that we have. That we have uh, you'll find the, the aspect of inequalities that we have, uh, but, uh, I would say that the more general, I, I, I learned recently this concept of uh, wicked problems. And I think that that's the main, the main uh, aspect that we are facing. We are, we are going to be facing more frequently these wicked problems, a problem that is very difficult to solve. Uh, there, there is incomplete contradictory information. Uh, there are many stakeholders and uh, with different uh, opinions. And uh, there are large, implications, economic, social, environmental, um, personal beliefs, and so on. And there is this interconnection. <laughs> so I think that that has to do with related with the complexity that Michael was, uh, was talking about. And I would, I would end mentioning that I think that before the pandemic, the pandemic, we had one storm coming, and that was the fourth industrial revolution. And then comes the pandemic, and then we have two storms collide, and now we have a mega storm. Uh, because also the pandemic is generating lots of changes. So, so what are some concrete steps that you would like to see universities in general take to kind of meet those those two uh, mega storms? Uh, President Garza, why don't you start us off? Well, you know, you, I think that uh, this crisis has uh, taught us that we can take bolder, riskier decisions, and we can do things differently from what we used to do. Uh, I think that uh, definitely one thing that comes to my mind is that international cooperation between and among universities to try to, to go ahead about these complexity issues will be fundamental because uh, we are institutions that uh, we don't have all the capabilities, all the resources, all the expertise, but we are complementary. So I think that that will be a key in the upcoming, uh, one, one of the things that we have, uh, we have to work. And uh, I think that this aspect about the high tech, high touch element is something that we also need to embrace more and more. I mean, be very conscious that we are, we are within a community, but we have a global responsibility as well towards all of these issues. None of these issues will be solved locally. All of these issues require global cooperation. Yeah, and so um, President Crow, correct me if I'm wrong, but but the way I understand it, um, in terms of the model of the fifth wave institution, is um, it's it's working towards collaborative rather than competitive uh, institutions in order to solve some of these um, wicked problems. So, kind of take us into to your vision for for more collaboration between higher education institutions and and some concrete steps that we might take to address these complexities that you've outlined. Yeah, so one of the things that uh, Jonathan Cole, the very uh, capable scholar of the design of universities from Columbia University has talked about for a long time is, why are all the leagues in the United States and in Mexico sports leagues between colleges? We compete uh, athletically against each other, and then we compete in every other possible way, and we compete basically to become more and more and more exclusive. 
Uh, and, and so that, while that might be fine for some schools, that can't be the path for all schools. And so two emergent fifth wave schools like Tech and uh, ASU, you know, the notion for us then is how do we find a way to, on a regular basis, uh, as David has already mentioned, to have uh, leagues focused on global climate change, uh, not competing only for resources, uh, to take the expertise that's at Tech and the expertise that's at ASU, and I've been arguing for this for a long time, and build truly transnational research enterprises. We don't have that in general. We have transnational projects, a few faculty members working together. We don't have truly transnational things. The problems are at a scale. Let's take just the pandemic. Because we were broken down into these segmented, isolated universities that weren't really working together and governments viewing the world in different kinds of ways, this pandemic got away from us almost immediately and it's not back in the bottle yet. Uh, and it's not back in the bottle because we still can't figure out how to work together in ways. And so we should not be assembling once some kind of crisis occurs. We should already be assembled, already working together. So we need leagues focused on, uh, let's, say, let's say something that we learned from tech. So we learned from tech that you could do a great job uh, uh, taking university assets and then teaching in high schools and then tech the millennial you know, where you've got a whole new model, a whole new way to advance engineering education, which we've also absorbed those things. Well, we should probably be working with tech and others to make sure that, that there is no problem that the universities in some form of connectedness can't be engaged in. It is impossible to take thousands and thousands of colleges and universities and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of faculty members spread out across disciplines and organize them quickly enough to be engaged in the kinds of problems and challenges that we're facing, it's not possible. We already have to be organized and we now have the technology to do that. We have the systems to do that. We have the drive to do that. We have the understanding to do that. And if the virus hasn't gotten your attention yet, nothing will. Uh, and, so, and so we now have everyone's attention. So now what we need are new models, new ways to work together to, to take all the intellectual assets that we have and bring them to bear. And so what would what would that enterprise actually look like? Like I'm thinking logistically, let's what are the steps to 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 arm, you know, model this out? What should well, we let, be doing? Well, let, let's take something like let's just take something like uh, North America. So North America is Canada, the United States and Mexico. So that's uh, 330, 130, 460, 30. That's 500 million people. 500 million people living in one of the most rapidly evolving economies on the planet. Mexico's economy is going gangbusters, you know, in, in, in the last 50 or 60 years, you know, it's risen to be a G20 country. It's uh, about to overtake Russia in terms of the size of the economy. Canada is very successful. The United States is very successful, but none of us have worked out the issues of sustainability or water or any of these other kinds of issues. We haven't worked on those together. They're not separable by countries. You know, the region is so large, uh, let's call it uh, uh, approaching 10 million square miles. You take 10 million square miles of the planet, 500 million people and only three countries. We have to find a way to bring all the major institutions of higher education together within, those, within that region and start producing the, the people and the solutions that we need for the region, not for the little local thing. That will never work. The scale is too big. We have to scale up. We need new institutions, new collaborations, new structures and new designs to be able to take the intellectual assets of the universities and apply them to the scales of the problems. Yeah, and, and I wanna bring um, President Garza uh, in here a little bit. Uh, President Garza, you mentioned kind of one of your big eyes is um, internationalization. Um, and, and one thing that I've been thinking a lot about, certainly this has changed because of the pandemic, but if we look back to the 2018, 2019 school year, around 15,000 Mexican students studied in the US and around 6,000 US students studied in Mexico. But those are really, really low numbers if you compare them to other countries. And you also think about the social, economic, cultural, familial ties between the two countries. Um, so kind of what are your aspirations for uh, US-Mexico knowledge and, and research exchange in, in this sort of model that President Crow has outlined? Sure, real quick, let me, let me just talk about uh, the internationalization aspect and then focus on the US-Mexico uh, aspect. Sure. Uh, the, uh, when, when, uh, Tech de Monterrey has been uh, promoting internationalization for many, many years. I think that uh, that's also something that we share with ASU. Uh, but uh, currently about 60% of our students graduate with an international experience. 
and every year about 7,000 students go abroad uh, uh, just, from, just from tech. Uh, but what we want to do is uh, to, move, uh, to continue increasing that uh, mobility of students, but not just talk of internationalization, just about mobility of undergraduate students, but take it to the next level from internationalization of students to internationalization of tech. And here, what we mean, it has to do, uh, it's related to what Michael was saying in terms of uh, trying to engage in long-term initiatives, not just uh, because one faculty is working with another faculty, that's a, that's a must, you, have, you need to have that, but what are some other in, in long-term initiatives that will be impactful uh, for both institutions, for both countries. So that's how we want to evolve towards being a more international institution, also tackling global problems, not just uh, local problems, but actually problems that ones that we contribute to the global aspect, we are contributing to the to the local element. In terms of the US, Mexico, our uh, internationalization aspect, uh, you currently in terms of student mobility, in our case, uh, US is the fourth country uh, for election by students. Uh, here, there are many reasons. I mean, uh, students, young students want to be as far away as possible from home uh, for the type of experience. There are cost uh, related aspects. And perhaps during the four years, uh, during the past years, there was also this uh, notion that perhaps uh, there was not uh, uh, good opportunities for them uh, in, the, in the States compared to other places. Uh, definitely, we need to be more creative in terms of the incentives, but I think that the key element, it has to do with the fact that internationalization, internationalization be seen, uh, that needs to be seen not just by undergrad mobility, but by other elements. Currently, we can have virtual mobility, not to replace the depression, the face-to-face -face and the presential mobility, but to complement that. We can have international, internationalization through these long-term initiatives uh, that we can launch together. I think that uh, uh, border initiatives will be very important also for US and Mexico uh, to tackle and to, to work during the upcoming years, aspects related to energy, water, climate change, migration, poverty, and so on. So those are some of the, of the things that I would, I would share at this point. Yeah, thank you so much. And just um, kind of to wrap us up here quickly, I want to ask you both um, to share in about a minute or so what, um, what has been the, the hardest most painful lesson um, of this crisis for you and and how are you adapting your institution to make sure uh, you know you you move uh, you, you progress and develop um, after that lesson uh, President Crow why don't you start us up here you know I don't know that all the lessons have been learned yet because we're not through this yet uh, you know I estimate that we're less than 50 percent through the actual management move to the management of the pandemic itself uh, and I can talk more about that, but the, the hardest lessons or the most painful lessons for me have been to uh, uh, watch our political systems be incapable of understanding actually what's happening uh, and to understand that we educated those people and we created those systems and, and uh, to watch uh, scientists communicating in ways in which they engendered fear versus confidence uh, uh, by uh, talking in a certain kind of tonality. And so our inability, so the thing that's caused me the most pain is to see the limits of where we are. So here we are now, 8 billion plus people. We have a global pandemic that uh, is uh, wreaking havoc across the entire planet. Um, and uh, we are, except in totalitarian states, you know, where a few people make decisions and force those decisions on other people, except for those places and a few other exceptions, it's been extremely difficult. Uh, and the difficulty is a function uh, which we in the educational enterprises have to own. Uh, and so we have to own that we've underprepared. So that was more than a minute, but uh, that was, that's no, my answer. No, it's a big lesson. So, so it, it, it merits more than a minute, but uh, President Garza, what, what is the, the most painful lesson for you and, and how, how are you planning to not have to relearn it? Okay, uh, let, me, let me share it in uh, three level of, of responses for that. Uh, one is uh, perhaps personally, I would say the most painful moment was learning that some member of our community got infected and died during the lockdown. Uh, talking about campus level or university level, I would say that losing the campus experience for the entire community, the, especially for freshmen and for new faculty and for students that are graduating, and at more global level, I would say this 
lack of seriousness of some leaders about uh, taking the facts of science and evidence to take decisions and ignoring that. I think that that, uh, I would say, were among the most painful lessons. And uh, in terms about uh, uh, what can we do to prevent, I will go into the campus experience. I would say that we need to appreciate uh, uh, every single moment when we go back to campus and don't take it for granted and enjoy every single interaction and think that those face-to-face -face interactions are our transformative opportunities that we as individuals have in a university community. I think that's that's so true and that's that's something I learned. I, I was on, on the tech campus during the 2017 earthquake in, in Mexico City and um, obviously a, a, a horrific tragedy and, and that moment of getting to go back to campus and, and hugging classmates was was something that I'll always remember. Um, so this has been a really interesting educational and aspirational conversation, um, but I think certainly the, the measure of these conversations is the way that they translate into action off the screen or, or maybe in the old days, um, hopefully in the future as well, kind of outside the auditorium. Um, and so in the spirit of that, President Crow and President Garza are going to close the conversation by signing a memorandum of understanding, uh, President Crow has it there, uh, that expands existing collaboration uh, between the tech and ASU on student exchange programs. So uh, the program known as Acceso gives bilingual ASU students an opportunity to take tech courses online, earning credit toward an ASU degree. And, um, you know, really what it is doing is increasing access to a binational uh, educational experience marked by excellence, uh, thanks to uh, the tech's impressive academic offering. So um, we can see uh, both presidents have, have signed the MOU. I think uh, normally we would, we would have a round of applause here. So uh, I'm clapping um, <laughs> uh, and hopefully our audience here at home is clapping as well. Um, and I just wanna uh, give a special thanks uh, for making this program possible uh, to Paula Garcia, Jose Cardenas and Julia Rosen of ASU, as well as Juan Pablo Murra, Raul Rodriguez and Silvia Farias from the tech. Um, so I just want to give you uh, each 30 to 60 seconds to, to tell me here what, what the program means for your institution and, and what the significance of signing this MOU is. Um, do you want to start, President Garza? Yes, I mean, uh, talking about uh, uh, one of the eyes, the eye of internationalization, I mean, the opportunity to interact with ASU and to get uh, with some youth of people in the, in the States, uh, we were talking about related to the, this fifth wave and to access uh, to people that otherwise cannot have opportunities. Uh, some of our students will participate in this program. Some of our faculty will be also uh, uh, taking, taking place. And I, I like uh, that now we're taking these steps related to access and related to so how Tech de Monterrey can also interact and have a, a more impact with a community that ASU is also serving. Thank you, President Garza. President Crow? Well, all I would say is that, you know, Mexico and the United States are, uh, you know, very, very close first cousins. You know, we're, we're two democracies emerging here in the Western Hemisphere that have, you know, really gone through civil wars and revolutions internal. And we finally have, you know, brought ourselves to this point and we're modernizing and culturally evolving and moving in the right direction. And one aspect of that is the kind of relationship between tech and ASU two universities in two different countries that have the same vision for the future, scaled impact on a national level. And then this agreement allows us to take that uh, a relationship one step further, more students engaging like you did, Mia, more, more people engaging, and then using technology to shorten the distance and reduce the cost and make it more accessible and make these things happen. So for me, it's just another step in the further emergence of this North American community between Canada, the United States and Mexico, but the relationship between tech and ASU being an unbelievably important part of that. And so we're very excited about this next step. Thank you so much, President Crow. Thank you, President Garza. Thank you to all of you who have joined us uh, here online. Um, it's been a real pleasure for me, and I just um, wanted to let you know that you can keep up to date on future tense what, uh, events, future 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 tense events on New America's website. Um, and you can also get the latest on activities from all three institutions by following them on Twitter. That's at future tense now, at Tech de Monterrey and at ASU underscore MX. Um, so with that, thank you so much. Uh, take care, cuídense, and hopefully we can see each other in person soon. <laughs>